Hi and welcome to Introducing the Bible, the show that studies the script of the greatest story on earth in order to help us get a better look at its author and star performer, God. When we read a book or a script, we usually start at the beginning and look for the plot or the thread of the main argument and follow it through to the end. We let the author's mind lead ours. But when we read the Bible, we often use a different approach. We view it as a collection of helpful advice that we reach for in times of trouble. But the Bible is a collection of books written by many authors according to the plan of one mind, the mind of God. It has a story with a main theme. The theme is about God, who He is, what He's done, and what He plans to do. It's all about His fame. He's the focal character. He commands the centre stage. It's His great accomplishment story in saving His people. The climax of the story comes when Jesus arrives on the scene. For the next half hour, we'll be focusing on the first few chapters of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. It describes the creation of the world and human rebellion against God. From the timeline, you can see that it's at the beginning of the Bible drama. Traditionally, the great Israelite leader Moses is thought to be the author of Genesis. His first two chapters portray creation. In them, he introduces us to God, to God's existence, God's power, God's wisdom, and God's love. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome to divide the water and keep it in two separate places. So God made a dome and it separated the water under it from the water above it. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered together in one place, and let dry ground appear. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, plants that bear grain and trees that bear fruit according to their various kinds. And it was so, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let the light shine in the sky to give light to the earth. And it was so. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning. The fourth day. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures. And let birds fly above the earth across the sky. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, 
Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every plant bearing grain on the face of the whole earth and every tree bearing fruit. They will be your food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And so the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he was doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Well, the opening chapters of the Bible are brilliant pieces of literature and enormously important. They tell us something that we wouldn't otherwise know. Uh, they make perfectly clear, uh, firstly, that the world we live in and the universe we find ourselves in is not just a result of time and chance. It's not just an accident. But behind it all is God. The message of those two chapters is summed up in the opening words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God made everything. Everything that is has come to us from God. Genesis tells us about the character of God, that uh, he is Lord over all things. The fact that he creates out of nothing simply by his word uh, means that he owns all things, that all things are under his kingship. He has the right to rule. And also one thing that comes out of the the this first Genesis creation account is that he orders all things in their right relationship so that the pinnacle of the creation is the human race and God is Lord over all human beings are lords over the rest of creation and things fit together in the way that God says the kingdom of God is outlined in the story of Adam and Eve in this story three points regarding the kingdom of God are made the kingdom of God is not an Old Testament phrase. It actually one we borrow from the New Testament, but it, but it is one which points back to the Old Testament. To have a kingdom, you've got to have a king. And we see God as, as king and Lord because he's created all things. A kingdom also has its subjects, and the subjects turn out to be the human race uh, when they're first created. They are under God's rule. But a kingdom is not an abstract thing. It, it happens in a place. And this is consistently shown in the Bible that when God has his people as his people, they are in some place that he has made for them, the very best possible place. And this is where the physical universe fits in. So the very first expression of the kingdom of God in the Bible is God exercising his lordship over Adam and Eve in the garden where they exercise lordship or kingship, if you like, over the rest of the creation. If you ask people who have seen Jesus Christ Superstar what their favourite song was, many people would say Mary's song, I Don't Know How to Love Him. I wouldn't want to know, he scares me so. Most people don't know how to love God. In the book of Psalms, one man writes a wonderful song of praise expressing his love for God, Psalm 104. He paints a picture of God's power and majesty in the perfection of creation. But the psalmist finishes on a sad note. Wickedness and human rebellion are a part of the world. Earlier, a sign of how out of control Los Angeles was going to get, a white man dragged out of his truck and beaten with rocks and a brick, then shot for no reason. This is attempted murder. Moses writes in the third chapter of the book of Genesis about human rebellion against God's authority. People want to live lives independent of him. And this independence breaks down the order and harmony of creation. Their relationship with God, each other and creation are reversed. No longer do they obey God as their king. Instead, they allow creation to dictate to them how they should live. Chaos develops into conflict. People praise objects of nature as gods. And God is ignored. Living lives independent of God isn't just wrong, it's dumb. Well, the greatest foolishness uh, that the Bible can see is for uh, 
people whom God has made to live independent of God. I mean, it's foolish simply because it's a denial of reality. Uh, God is really there. He really has made the world. He is good. And for his creatures, those who've been made by him, to live as though he's not there and live as though they're not his creatures is the greatest foolishness there is. But it's not foolishness just because it's a denial of reality. It's a foolishness because God will not tolerate it. Uh, he is good and he will not tolerate evil. And the most fundamental evil is to defy him. And so not only do you live in a, a fool's paradise uh, or fool's something else by denying the reality of God and trying to live independently of God, but you set yourself over against God and you, uh, you try to defy God. And if you can think of anything more foolish than us little creatures trying to defy the God who made everything, uh, I defy you to think of anything more stupid than that. The Bible, like a good Hollywood movie, has three acts. God created, God's rejected, God... The rest of the Bible is the outworking of the third act. What is God's response to human rebellion? This is God's dilemma. Does he scrap it all and start again? Or does he plan to save people? The rest of the Bible reveals how God sets about to save people. In the Jesus video, according to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells a story about God's response to sin. There was once a man who planted a vineyard, rented it out to tenants, and then left home for a long time. When the time came to gather the grapes, he sent a slave to the tenants to receive from them his share of the harvest. But the tenants beat the slave and sent him back without a thing. So he sent another slave. But the tenants beat him too, treated him shamefully and sent him back without a thing. Then he sent a third slave. But the tenants wounded him too and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said to himself, what shall I do? I will send my own dear son. Surely they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him coming, they said to one another, this is the owner's son. Let's kill him and his property will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants? He will come and kill those men and give the vineyard over to other tenants. What then does this scripture mean? The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. Everyone who falls on that stone will be cut to pieces. And if that stone falls on someone, it will crush him to dust. Now, we human beings have used our freedom uh, to cast off God and to seek to live independently of God and to take no notice of God. Now, the Bible's simple three-letter word to describe that attitude of heart uh, is, is the word sin. That's what sin is. God's attitude to sin, well, he will not tolerate it uh, because it is a defiance against the, the, the fundamentally good thing that there is. The fundamental good thing, remember, is God and his will. Now, to, uh, to defy that is the fundamental evil. And uh, God, who is good, uh, will not tolerate it and he will overthrow it. There is a way out from the judgment which God provides, and this is uh, worked out throughout the whole of the range of, of the biblical story, that God, in a sense, has a problem, if we can talk about him like that, and that is how can he be God, how can he be just and righteous and accept people who are in rebellion against him? And it's really the gospel that is the answer, and that is that God says you must stop rebelling but he has provided a way for forgiveness so that those who do stop rebelling and accept his way of forgiveness find what the Bible calls grace, that is God's loving kindness towards those who don't deserve it at all. They really deserve the very opposite, but he shows loving kindness to them and reconciliation is found. And this, this is worked out finally in the person and work of Jesus in his life, death and resurrection. That's God's answer to his problem. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the livestock and all the wild creatures. 
You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. There's a wonderful statement there in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. It's cryptic. Uh, it's not clear, and I don't think it was clear to the people who first heard it or even first wrote it. Uh, but it, it, is, it, is a, it is a promise that the day will eventually come when the serpent, who represents the evil that has emerged in what God has created, the serpent will be crushed. Evil will be overthrown. And not only that, but will be overthrown through the human race. So that's about all you see in Genesis 3.15, that, that somehow through the human race that God has made, through the human race that has actually rebelled against God, uh, evil is going to be overthrown. Now how it eventually happens, of course, is through the coming of Jesus. And you, read, you find in the New Testament that Jesus is the one who crushes the serpent and those who belong to Jesus join him. Uh, in, the overthrow of the, in the overthrow of evil now and the ultimate overthrow of evil. In the New Testament, the Gospel writer Matthew tells us that a child was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. He was to be called Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is God who has come to save his people. He is the central figure in the conclusion of the Bible drama. Jesus came to respond to humanity's problem of sin. He came to bring us back into a right relationship with God. God created men and women to enjoy His company. But when we rebelled against His authority, He didn't give up on us. From the beginning of the world until now, God has been actively working towards saving His people. And that's what the Bible's all about. Why not introduce yourself to more of the facts behind the book in our next episode of Introducing the Bible? <laughs> 